Witka, thanks so much for coming on to Information Soup all the way from your office in Tennessee. You are a vertebrate paleontologist and zooarchaeologist, and your main interest is in the evolution and extinction of North American proboscideans, specifically mammoths and mastodons. Today, we're going to be looking at everything from why these majestic beasts went extinct to how we could use modern DNA techniques to possibly bring them back. So how have you been, Chris? I know that um, you got into the paleo world fairly late in the game, but uh, is it true that you started out as a jazz musician? <laughs> yes. Uh, I, Unlike many paleontologists, uh, I did not start out as a four-year-old loving dinosaurs. They were great, but uh, for the most part, I spent my childhood thinking about other things and spent my first two years of college in the conservatory of music at Kansas City. Um, ultimately, wanted to be a jazz musician, a uh, jazz trombonist, uh, gigged around Kansas City, and then once I kind of made a transition back to the sciences, um, I... Um, I continued to gig around and kind of continued to put food on the table throughout my undergraduate degrees uh, and, uh, you know, playing jazz around town. It, it was kind of interesting because when I transitioned from the back from music to science, I found that I was kind of hanging out with the same sorts of people, the same kind of personalities. Mm. And one of the neat things was and I, I eventually I put two and two together and I realized that Jazz and music in general, you're taking a very technical uh, kind of activity. So your scales, your, yeah. your chords, that sort of thing. And you're doing something really creative with it. And yeah. science is not all that different. You know, rather than taking our scales and chords, we're taking our radiocarbon dates or our stable isotope data or our measurements on bones. And we're ultimately trying to interpret it in a more creative way. And so the, the kinds of personalities that are attracted to what seemingly are very different uh, fields are, are really pretty similar. The music of science, eh? Yes, the music of science. Exactly. Well, before we time travel back to the world of mammoths, let's just hear a little bit more about your background. Before you began studying mammoths and mastodons, you trained as a uh, zoo archaeologist. Isn't that right? That's exactly right. Uh, I grew up in central Nebraska, rural Nebraska, uh, out on the Great Plains. And our record that was around us um, was really a quaternary record, a record of the Ice Age. Um, it was not something I paid a lot of attention to as a child, but after I transitioned from music to uh, anthropology and archaeology, uh, I realized that that was something that was very interesting to me. Um, I trained at, uh, at the University of Nebraska as an archaeologist and then did my graduate work at the University of Kansas, so all out on the Great Plains. Yeah. Um, was mostly interested in the uh, aspects of the archaeological record that overlapped with megafauna. So my dissertation really dealt with uh, ancient bison and how people might have used those ancient bison, how those ancient bison might have moved around a landscape. But it also dealt with uh, sites that were particularly old, uh, so Paleo-Indian age sites that from from uh, you know a time period where people overlapped with extinct megafauna like mammoths and mastodons. After finishing my graduate work at the University of Kansas. Um, I was applying for jobs everywhere and applied for a, an archaeology position at the Illinois State Museum. And the, the director called me up the week afterwards and said, you just aren't really what we're looking for here. But we think that you'd be a pretty good fit for a vertebrate paleontology position that we have open. And so my journey to vertebrate paleontology is, is fairly atypical, um, coming to it from zooarchaeology. But if we look at the quaternary record in North America, and particularly in Eastern North America, where it's a fairly young record, uh, it kind of makes sense. Um, you know, so the, 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 the mammoths and mastodons that I was looking at as a zooarchaeologist, you just change the time frame and you're looking at the quaternary record in the Eastern U.S. or at least in the Midwest, where it's a fairly short, shallow record. Um, so I spent about 10 years at the Illinois State Museum in Springfield, Illinois, as a curator of geology. Uh, and then about five years ago, I moved down here to Johnson City, Tennessee, where I'm the head curator at the Great Fossil Site and Museum. Uh, here, as, as head curator, I, I, in addition to um, you know, working with graduate students and students and teaching, uh, I'm also kind of helping out with uh, managing the museum. And ultimately, one of the, the things that attracted me down here is 
uh, a, a very large mastodon or a couple of very large mastodons that we've been excavating from the five million year old gray fossil site. Okay, let's talk all things mammoths. These very popular extinct mammals are part of the group known as the proboscideans, a weird and wonderful group that would take too long to fully describe in this interview, which gave rise to the animals that you currently study. Briefly, Chris, what is the evolutionary history of the North American mammoth? So kind of backing up to the, the biogeography of mammoths as a whole and elephants as a whole, um, we are looking at a, a, a multi-million year history. Um, the first proboscideans into North America were not mammoths. Uh, they were mastodons. Uh, mm. Mammoon Americanum is the most the American mastodon, is the most recent uh, iteration of mastodons in North America, and gomphotheres. So if some of you have heard of things like shovel tuskers uh, or four tuskers, those are, those are gomphotheres. And both mastodons and gomphotheres got here uh, about 16 and a half million years ago. So they're kind of a recent, uh, they, they, they're kind of a recent immigrant to North America, um, but they aren't the most recent. And so mammoths don't get here until about a million and a half years ago. So some of mm. our earliest mammoth fossils uh, come from Florida. There's some from California um, and some in between. And so some of those earliest mammal fossils are, or mammoth fossils are about one and a half million years old. Um, there's, this has kind of changed recently. Uh, we'll talk more about ancient DNA, I'm sure, in, in, in the future here. But um, there was a recent paper that came out that was looking at the Christofka mammoth in northern Siberia. And some of the earliest DNA, some of the oldest DNA that has been extracted anywhere in the world comes from mammoths from Siberia. And this is a paper that came out this year, 2021. And uh, it gave us some insight into who these early mammoths might have been. Um, so it, it, the, basically what the, these authors suggested is that the Colombian mammoth that we have here in North America, starting about one and a half million years ago, um, was a hybrid species, or at least the Colombian mammoth that we're familiar oh, wow. with was a hybrid species between uh, a, an ancient Siberian lineage uh, that was represented by this one million year old mammoth tooth from Siberia and woolly mammoths. So some other uh, woolly mammoth lineage about 500 thousand years ago kind of interbreeding with this other lineage and then ultimately producing the Columbian mammoth. So we have uh, a kind of a deep history of mammoths here, um, but they aren't the deepest. You know, we, we definitely have mastodons and gomphotheres that are, they're much older. So can you give us a description of the North American mammoth and where they were first discovered? So we have two general types of mammoths that we think of when we talk about North American mammoths. Uh, we have one group of mammoths that are woolly mammoths, uh, and these are whole Arctic in distribution. These are the same species uh, as we get in Eurasia uh, and we have throughout the Arctic. Um, and they appear in the southern uh, parts of North America to the southernmost woolly mammoth actually gets down to about central Illinois, maybe maybe even to within a, a, a few miles from where I'm at right now in southwestern Virginia. Um, the other mammoth that we have here is the Columbian mammoth. And the Columbian mammoth seems to be a more southerly uh, morphological type. Uh, so we get the Columbian mammoths in the, the desert southwest, out in California. We see Columbian mammoths in Florida and Texas, and so they tend to be this, this southern mammoth. Um, the woolly mammoth is a bit smaller than the Columbian mammoth uh, in general. The Columbian mammoth we think is probably averages about 10 feet tall or about three meters tall, three and a half meters tall uh, at the shoulder and uh, usually about nine and a half to 10 tons. Uh, so it's a fairly wow. large animal. Um, uh, everybody always asks about the hair of the woolly mammoth. Mm. And from what we can tell, um, you know, not all mammoths were hairy. Uh, so there's, in, in modern Asian elephants, for instance, there seems to be a latitudinal climbs in, in the amount yeah. of hair cover in a body. And so the, the more northerly elephants have more hair than the more southerly elephants. And we suspect that that was probably the case with mammoths too. So mammoths from 
uh, Alaska or Canada were certainly woolly. Uh, they, they had to retain that body heat because it was definitely mm-hmm. colder up there. And mammoths from Florida, or from South Texas, may, maybe not, or from Mexico, you know, they, they may have had a lot less, less body hair. Um, we traditionally think when we say mammoth, we think of them as step tundra grazers. So open land grazers that are eating grass, eating, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, vegetation that is, is fairly gritty and that reflects, that is reflected in the morphology of their teeth too. So that's kind of the, what we think of when we say mammoths in a broad general description. Uh, I'll get into a little bit more of that later when we get into the mm-hmm. fun nitty gritty stuff when we're talking right. about DNA. Um, as for the history of North American mammoths, uh, actually some of the first vertebrate fossils in North America that were kind of considered that were discovered by European colonists um, were mammoth fossils. So one of the first records of, um, uh, of vertebrate fossils in discovered in South Carolina in 1735 uh, were discovered by enslaved people on a, on a plantation. And it, they were a pair of mammoth molars. Uh, the, the slaves were able to identify those mammoth molars as being very similar to elephants. And so they actually, the, the, the understanding that these mammoths were related to elephants predates uh, a, a lot of European naturalists' understanding of it. Some of the first uh, mastodons, for instance, uh, that European naturalists saw, they thought that they were carnivores. They thought they were something totally different. They didn't really make the connection that these were teeth of some sort of elephant. So mammoths really play a role in some of the earliest uh, vertebrate paleontology that was was performed here in North America. Um, indigenous people probably uh, were aware of these fossils throughout history. And uh, we do see the use of mammoth ivory in uh, northern crafts, for instance. So um, we see some Mammoth and mastodon mm-hmm. bones that get incorporated into archaeological sites, uh, and all of these things predate uh, European colonization. So, I mean, there's kind of this this th- these are the the fossils that are very easy to find on the landscape, which is fun both as a paleontologist and thinking about discovery and trying to understand the nuts and bolts of how um, mammoth populations were put together on the continent. But they're also fun from looking at this historical aspect of things. Um, the earliest, what the site that is called the the birthplace of of uh, North American vertebrate paleontology is a site called Big Bone Lick in the Ohio River Valley, just south of Cincinnati in Kentucky. And this is a site that is known for its mastodon fossils, but of course it also has mammoth teeth and and all the other quaternary fauna. So. Um, really from the beginning. And if you look at some of the early discussions of what are mammoths and what are mastodons in North America, they're really f- featuring some of the, the the founding fathers. So Thomas Jefferson was thinking about what mammoths and mastodons are. Benjamin Franklin was working on this. Uh, uh, Meriwether Lewis and, and, uh, and Clark uh, both collected fossils for Thomas Jefferson at Big Bone Lick. So this is the mammoth and mastodon fossils are really part of some of the first scientific paleontology that was performed in North America. The split between modern Asian elephants and mammoths happened about 5 million years ago before they left Africa. Um, so, so yeah, mammoths are coming out of Africa about 5 million years ago. And according to DNA evidence, um, that split or that, that emergence from Africa uh, occurred about 5 million years ago. Chris, what about the behavior of these animals? If we were to travel back in time, what would we observe? So this is something that has fascinated me for a long time. Um, The traditional idea of mammoths is that they are this open land grazer. Whether you're a woolly mammoth or you're a Colombian mammoth, you're eating grass, uh, you're not occupying forests. 
And this, some of this has changed in recent years. Um, so during my tenure at the Illinois State Museum and as a Midwestern paleontologist, we had a big project where we were basically kind of doing a museum crawl across the Midwest and looking at people's mm. collections. We were uh, collecting radiocarbon dates. We were collecting stable isotope samples, trying to understand really kind of at this, this nitty gritty level um, what these animals ate, uh, how their ecology changed through time. Um, mammoths and mastodons, proboscideans in general, are what we consider ecosystem engineers. So their impact on how an ecosystem is put together and the processes processes that are occurring in an ecosystem really is outsized in comparison to how many they are in their biomass. So elephants in general, um, they uh, impact ecosystems by um, disturbance. They trample things. They push over trees. Uh, they impact ecosystems by in nutrient cycling. So looking at their dung uh, adds a whole lot of, of nitrogen back into back into uh, you know the soil and that sort of thing. So we know that mammoths and mastodons or mammoths, uh, wherever they are, are going to have kind of this outsized impact on their ecosystem. And this is translated into some of my research that's been looking at stable isotopes in mammoth and mammoths and mastodons and comparing the two. One of the cool things about the Midwestern record is that we were finding basically that mammoths survived much longer than we expected. Given the traditional model of, of mammoth ecology, we expected them to basically kind of follow the glaciers to the north as the glaciers receded. Uh, you know, the, this idea that mammoths really had to stick around uh, this open steppe environment because we knew that as the glaciers receded, there was forests that were filling in behind them. And so if, if mammoths wanted to follow that niche, they would have had to have gone north. What we found once we started dating some of these animals was that they hung around in the Midwest even after the glaciers were long gone, which meant that they were not only in forests, in fairly closed forests, uh, at, at, towards the end of the Pleistocene, but they were basically shoulder to shoulder with other proboscideans like mastodons. Um, they were both on the landscape at the same time. Sometimes they even occurred in the same sites together. So this was kind of a, a eye-opening experience that um, mammoth diets and mammoth ecology was a lot more flexible than we traditionally thought it might be. Um, so that was one thing. So they can eat, you know, they can survive in a forest just fine. Uh, Ultimately, it may impact how they go extinct a little bit. We can talk about a little bit about that later. But uh, the other thing that we've been really looking at lately uh, is mammoth mobility. And this is looking at a at an isotope system uh, using strontium isotopes. And strontium isotopes will basically, if you have the right tissue that forms incrementally over the course of that animal's life, then you can track that animal. Uh, across a landscape because the uh -huh. strontium isotopes tie back to underlying geology. And so one of the things that we've been working on for about 15 years uh, is really trying to get at, did mammoths migrate? You know, this very seemingly simple question. Uh, African elephants have some very long migrations uh, that have been observed. And so this is something that as paleontologists 20 years ago, we basically just had that modern analog to compare to and said, oh, well, modern African elephants migrate, so therefore uh, probably Colombian mammoths also migrated. What we're finding is that it's definitely more complicated. Um, so we have looked at strontium isotopes in mammoths uh, from a couple of different sites. And a lot of times it, it, we need to know from a, a site, we need to not only have mammoth remains, but we also need to ha understand how that, those strontium isotopes are distributed across the landscape. And so it's a little bit more difficult than just simply going out and drilling holes and fossils. Um, so we've done this for mammoths at the Waco Ma Mammoth Site in Texas. We've done this for mm -hmm. some mammoths in southwestern Missouri. And then more recently, um, you know, uh, my research group has also looked at some mammoths in uh, from the mammoth site in South Dakota. Uh, there are other Researchers that have looked at Florida mammoths, that have looked at Arizona mammoth, that, and then there's this great paper that came out a couple of months ago on this Alaskan mammoth tusk, uh, where they were looking at how this animal moved over the course of about 28 years. And so as long-lived animals, there's the potential for really piecing together a, a high-resolution 
uh, history of where this animal was at a certain time of its, of its life, what that animal was eating and what season it was eating in it. This is a, a phenomenal uh, potential uh, record that we're working on. In here in the southern 48, um, our mammoths tend to not move very far seasonally. Uh, mm. So we can look at how, how, how those strontium isotope changes throughout the length of a tooth uh, or throughout a tusk growth, and uh, they don't seem to be moving very far seasonally. So, you know, a, a, a home range of 70 kilometers or so. But over the course of multiple years, like I said, these are long-lived animals. So they may spend a year or two in one place. And then ultimately what we have is some evidence that they're, they were dispersing kind of widely. So we have one animal from, uh, from a site in southwestern Missouri that has strontium isotope values in its teeth that are representative of uh, a location that was about 250 kilometers to the east. Um, and mm. But at, so at some point it moved those 250 kilometers, but we don't have the resolution to really say, oh, it did it all in a year or it did it back and forth. We just know that while that record was forming, that animal only lived in that other location. It did not live where it died. So that's something that's coming mm. together. And I think that that's a piece of research that in the next couple of years, probably in the next five to 10 years is going to be really exciting. So I know it, uh, that uh, modern African elephants, uh, they will do a migratory route and they'll do the same one to the same place over and over again. I think I'm right in saying that. Um, is there any way that you can determine that from the strontium isotopes of the uh, of these ancient mammoths? Yes. So we should be, see, be able to see that. And thus far, if we use that as our working hypothesis, that these are these animals are moving, uh, you know, quite some distance between a wet and a dry season or between a cold and a warm season, um, our, our, our hypothesis has been falsified every time. So thus far, we are not seeing very long migration uh, on an annual basis or on a seasonal basis. Well, a big question that is always asked about any of the megafauna is, why did they go extinct? Now, most people assume that human beings hunted mammoths to extinction, but what does the latest data tell us? So this is the million dollar question, uh, and, and sometimes literally because this has been a question that we've tackled through grants and projects for 20, right. 30, 50 <laughs> years. Uh, this has been an issue. And uh, this is also a question that, you know, my background as a zooarchaeologist has kind of come into play. Um, so coming to quaternary sciences and vertebrate paleontology from zooarchaeology, I kind of bring a different perspective to this that shares both the zooarchaeological perspective as well as this more paleontological perspective. And one of the things that um, has been really interesting to me is mm -hmm. If we want, if we are thinking about people basically hunting uh, proboscideans and uh, mammoths to extinction, or any of our North American megafauna, um, the evidence for that is actually pretty slim. Um, there's some modeling. There's a lot of modeling that that makes sense. There's the time frame is is uh, coincidental, um, but uh, but if you actually look at the record of, you know, what the earliest uh, peoples in North America were eating, very little of it is megafauna. Um, and if we look at the mammoth sites that overlap in time with people uh, and where we have associations of, of human artifacts with some of those skeletons, th there's still not a real great amount of evidence that really points to people using or hunting mm. these animals. So even you're saying all the paleo art is wrong, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not these, saying it's people wrong. Birds sort of going at it with the, with the spears and bringing down the mastodons and ch chasing them over, over cliffs. I'm saying it's <laughs> not particularly supported with empirical evidence. Okay. <laughs> uh, and so one of the, the interesting things that kind of pops up is, is what these sites typically look like is there's about 15 sites where we have either mammoths, mastodons, or gomp a single gomphothere uh, that's associated with human artifacts in North America. And what these sites typically look like is we have a mammoth or a skeleton or multiple skeletons in a very constrained area. Usually they're something like an ancient lake or an ancient bog. Um, and 
the archaeological record consists of literally a handful of tools, you know, less than 10 hmm. might be might be kind of associated with this skeleton. There's no hearths. There's no resharpening debris. You know, these are things that are coming from my my background as an archaeologist. And if I were approaching this record as an archaeologist, looking at human behavior and how it related to this dead elephant on the landscape, I would be hard pressed to say that it was hunted to extinction. We have one, maybe two mammoths that have really good evidence that they were hunted. The others, um, there's we, we could stretch the evidence and say that they were scavenged. We could stretch the evidence and say mm -hmm. that these are places on the landscape where both mammoths and humans were attracted to, you know, as wet ponds and, and as wet areas on a landscape that were attractants to game. Um, that's a possibility. If you look at the record of elephant hunting in Africa, um, it's, it's, it's a lot more complicated than just going out and, and poking an elephant with a stick. Uh, these are, these are, these are cultural, uh, processes that are kind of embedded within a group. And so there's a lot of, um, social structure involved. There's a lot of tradition involved. There's a lot of, um, you know, cultural knowledge that's involved that's built up over years. There's also usually very specialized equipment involved. And it doesn't happen very much if you look at the, the modern record of, uh, you know, African hunter-gatherers that are hunting elephants. Uh, it's, it's fairly rare in the record. And one of the things that, that kind of came back to me when I was really thinking about this is um, <laughs> now we have YouTube. And so if you, you plunk, you know, elephant hunting with spears into YouTube, you end up with a lot of... Um, Kind of archival video footage, archival movie footage, where you know a, a, a movie director would go over to Africa and, and you know pay some money to Maasai tribesmen and say, go try and kill that elephant over there. It's never as easy as it sounds. Uh, in fact, often it is gruesome. It is extremely dangerous for the people. This is something that was not taken lightly. It was not undertaken uh, lightly. So it, it it is something that I think we really need to think critically about how people might have hunted these animals, if that's possible. The other aspects of, uh, you know, how people may have driven these uh, animals extinct, they is, we often say, well, maybe there's some other sort of anthropogenic impact. So some other landscape scale impact that people had uh, in North America that drove these animals extinct, you know, that changed the environment. And the finger is often pointed at anthropogenic fire. And, you know, people were, were lighting fires on landscapes. We would have had forest fires and that sort of thing. And maybe that changed the environment to the level that uh, drove some of these megafauna extinct. And if we look at that, if we, we take that apart mm -hmm. a little bit, we have some really great uh, lake records, sediment records in the eastern U.S. for that time period. So the last 20,000 years, we can look at those lake records in quite a bit of detail. And we can get at fire histories for different parts of the eastern U.S. in a lot of details. And the places where we do have those fire histories, there is not an uptick in fire when people uh, show up. No. You know, th there really isn't an uptick in fire until eight or 9,000 years ago at the earliest. Uh, in a lot of the Midwest, it's not until you really see this drying period and you see a lot of uh, a, a lot more people on the landscape kind of in the middle Holocene. So we don't really see evidence for uh, an uptick in fire frequencies either. So as an archaeologist and a zooarchaeologist, I really, I, I think really critically about this record and I, I'm not convinced. And that was part of the reason why we went back to the record. We went back to uh, a lot of these other sites that are out there. We said, okay, let's get a whole bunch of new dates. Um, let's look at the taphonomy of, of all these sites, specifically in the Midwest, because this is a, a really good record where we, it's a really, it's a, it's a fine scale record where we also have associated charcoal records and associated vegetation change records. Um, and, uh, and we really wanted to look at this in detail. And there's a couple of cool things that pop out of that. Number one, mammoths and mastodons do not go extinct at, in the same way. They go extinct at the same time-ish, but they do not go extinct in the same way. Mammoths, uh, if you look at the hmm. last 20,000 years, 20,000 years ago, when glaciers were deep into North America, it was cold, 
is fairly dry, although it's still forested in the eastern U.S. Mammoths are basically the only animals that are in the central U.S. and uh, up to the glaciers. Yeah. Uh, we don't have any mastodons. They seem to be fairly temperature sensitive. Uh, as those glaciers recede, mammoths stick around, but then ma mastodons come in behind them. And what we see as they approach extinction, mammoths kind of go extinct gradually. They are a decreasing element on the landscape up until about 12,900, 12,700 years ago. Mastodons are actually increasing in numbers as they go extinct. So if you look at mastodons on the landscape 500 years before they go extinct, um, there haven't that those landscapes have not seen that many mastodons in within the 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 fossil record period hands down so we have lots of mastodons both in terms of uh we, we can measure them both in terms of the the number of sites on the landscape but also in terms of their biogeographic spread so their 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 range is at the greatest within a few hundred years before they go extinct uh also we have a number of sites where we have lots of mastodons in them um, so one of the sites that we were looking at was from southwestern Missouri, had 35 mastodons in it, 34 mm. mastodons in it. Uh, there's, there's sites in the Midwest where we have 11, 15, 12 mastodons from them. Uh, all these mastodons are, are more or less contemporary. It's not something where they're separated by multiple thousands of years. Um, so they kind of go extinct with a, with a boom. Um, you know, it's a crash in their population, whereas ma mammoths, kind of went extinct more gradually through time. So, you know, often we set this extinction up as it's got to be either people or it's climate change. And mm. I, 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 like I said, I kind of think critically about the people part because it doesn't seem to associate with, with humans hunting. Uh, and it doesn't really be seem to be associated with an uptick in fire frequencies. But on the climate change side, we also have to be thinking about what are the actual ecological mechanisms which might be affected by climate. You can't just say, oh, it got warmer and these animals couldn't survive. You have to think about, okay, how does that affect the vegetation, the diet? How does that affect the other uh, animals on the landscape? And, you know, kind of piecing together these ecological histories uh, as they approach extinction, knowing that mammoths went extinct in a different way than mastodons, they all kind of tie back into what this whole story is. So I won't pretend to know the answer right now, uh, but we're working on it. You know, this is something that we're kind of chipping away and we're still learning uh, a lot about the, the nuts and bolts of how these extinctions happened. Uh, but we're starting to realize that, number one, we need to do it at a regional level. We can't just look at the entire continent and say, people show up, megafauna go extinct. That, that, that scale just does not work um, to test either anthropogenic hypotheses or ecological hypotheses. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we need to really think about it from a regional perspective and we need to put together these, these kind of extinction uh, scenarios for all of the megafauna, depending on what taxa it is. So we can't just kind of apply, um, you know, a broad hypothesis and have it apply everywhere. And uh, it seems, Chris, that the more data points you get, and I know that this is, this is true in paleoanthropology, um, you don't get a clearer picture. Sometimes you get an even more confusing <laughs> picture, which is must be frustrating. Uh, actually, you know, as a scientist, I, we, we know that when we go out and we try and answer one question, uh, we, we probably won't be able to answer that one question, but we'll have 10 additional questions. Uh, and so that, that, that's just part of the, part of the, part of the profession. <laughs> yeah. And and that's what keeps me going. That's what really keeps me thinking about what's going on during this extinction is the fact that, you know, we've learned new things about how these extinctions happened in the last five years. We've moved the needle. Uh, whether you're talking about, you know, at, improvements in radiocarbon dating, whether you're talking about improvements in the associated climate record, whether you're talking about improvements in, in the associated record of, of, of people. Um, we have one of the highest resolution archaeological records for that time period anywhere in the world. And well, that might be a, a broad <laughs> thing, but certainly <laughs> there's been a lot of, of archaeological attention on this particular time period. It's not something that we can look at and say, oh, well, yeah, we just need another couple of sites and, and it'll all come together. It's something where we've got a pretty good database. And 
the questions that we're approaching it with and the methods that we're approaching it with are changing so quickly that, you know, talking to me about extinctions today is not like talking to me about extinctions five years ago or even five years into the future. You know, things can change. Um, you know, even it, it, to be fair, there's even some new discoveries that that happen that change the time frame. Uh, that change how we think about these things. And so mm -hmm. just recently we've had a, you know, a, a paper on um, trackways in white sands and uh, in New Mexico, in Southern New Mexico, and how this kind of demonstrates a contemporaneity with uh, proboscideans and people. And they're much older than we expected. The dates look pretty good. Uh, the association looks pretty good. And so we kind of need to start thinking, okay, uh, our timeline has to extend. And that's one of the, that's also one of the things that's really difficult to reconcile. Um, you know, as our timeline pushes back and for, for humans in North America, um, we, we, the, the original assumption of human overkill that we were dealing with a naive fauna um, doesn't hold up. Uh, so, you know, mm -hmm. these are, these are humans and megafauna are living together on a landscape for millennia at this point. Um, you know, in North America. And, and so I, we're not dealing with a naive fauna. Um, so people would really have to be having an over, they, they would need to be having a, a huge impact on these landscapes and on these ecosystems across the continent. And at this point, we're looking at basically kind of hunter gatherer populations that are not particularly dense on the landscape. And if we look at the rest of what we learned from archaeology and how hunter-gatherers use a landscape, um, this is not something that is easy to reconcile with, uh, you know, anthropogenic extinction. You also study mastodons, a smaller cousin of the mammoth. Many people get these two beasts confused, but they are actually completely different animals. Yes. Uh, so... We spent a lot of time thinking about mammoths, uh, especially a couple of years ago. Uh, some of the first uh, kind of continent-wide ancient DNA of, of, uh, of, of extinct megafauna really focused on trying to tease apart these different mammoth populations, if that was even possible. And one of the things that we found was that we started the project thinking that we're, there were four, maybe five species of mammoths in North America. Um, and then as we got DNA representatives from each one of those populations, we realized that they weren't nearly as different as we thought. So mammoths kind of seemed to be this genetic smear. Um, there was more or less a divide between eastern and western mammoths or between northern and southern mammoths. But overall, they were very, very similar, um, even to the point where, you know, they may have been able to interbreed. Um, this actually wasn't a surprise to us, that to those of us that are working in kind of the, the middle ground in between these two different groups. And, uh, and so what we were finding is that these, the, 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 the mammoths from, for instance, Iowa, in between what we would consider woolly mammoth land and Colombian mammoth land, they might have morphological attributes of both. Um, so the DNA actually kind of helped us with that. Mastodons also occur in a lot of these areas, especially in the eastern U.S. So they are also elephant-sized. They're a little bit smaller than Colombian mammoths, kind of in between a Colombian mammoth and a woolly mammoth in size. Uh, they're not as tall. Um, they're, they're shorter. Uh, they tend to be wider. Um, they kind of are more sl low slung. They have a, a lower forehead, straighter tusks. One of the main differences that we see in mastodons in the fossil record between mastodons and mammoths is that mastodon teeth are these massive kind of mm. knobbly, we call them bunodont teeth. So low crown teeth, mammoth teeth, um, look more like a loaf of bread. They're, they're, they're very high crowned. They're adapted to grazing abrasive vegetation like grass. Mastodons are not, they're, they're adapted to grazing leaves and woody vegetation. And, and, and kind of in keeping with that, they're usually found in forested environments. Um, so that is something that where mammoths, we, we often saw that they were occupying these forested environments, even though we used to think that they only mm only occupied open grasslands. Mastodons, for the most part, we still see them as occupying these forested environments. And the DNA story there is the complete opposite of mammoths. So mastodons, up until 2018, we just kind of looked at 
Ice Age mastodons in North America, and they were all one species, American mastodon, Mammoon americanum. Um, in 2018, there were some paleontologists, our colleagues out on the West Coast that looked at some of the California mastodons and said, you know, these are morphologically a little bit different than mastodons in the rest of the country. And so we're going to kind of separate these out just tentatively and say that they're, they're a different species of mastodon. They're not American mastodon. We're going to call them Pacific mastodon. Um, and then that was followed up by more DNA work. And the opposite pattern was apparent in mastodons. So rather than being kind of a smear of similar DNA across mastodons across the continent, we were seeing four, maybe five really deep, deeply separated lineages of mastodons, uh, of which the Midwest was one, this, this new species out in, on the West Coast was another. Um, you know, we were seeing some, some other lineages that are kind of represented by isolated specimens in the central part of, the, of North America. And, and these, these, these different lineages were, were very, very deep. Uh, the, the gaps between these, these lineages were very, very deep with their most recent common ancestors often being like three and a half to four and a half million years old. So we're dealing with a much deeper history of, of kind of a population that is evolving through time and adapting to different parts of the landscape. This fits with the evolutionary history of mastodons in North America. So they got here about 16 and a half million years ago and, and, you know, adapted to different parts of North America. Um, uh, you know, probably we, one of the, the big splits that we're seeing at that time uh, is a warming and drying of the middle part. So the development of the Great Plains and becoming a grassland. So if you had mastodons coming in about 16 million years, mm. colonizing most of the continent, and then the middle of the continent gets much drier. And from what we can tell, mastodons at any point in time are not particularly well adapted to grazing environments or drying environments. And so those mastodons in the middle, that creates a big split between these Western and Eastern populations that is becoming more evident in the, the genetic record. Some of them uh, have been known to have uh, chin tusks. Isn't that right? Yes. So one of the cool things about uh mastodons in general is that a lot of taxa also have tusks in their chin so tusks in their lower jaw and so these kind of stick out the bottom um, there are some other gomphothere uh, taxa that also have chin tusks and they've yeah. often been modified into really kind of crazy shapes but uh, one of the things that with mastodons is these these chin tusks don't aren't always present and that's one of the kind of ongoing questions is why do we get chin tusks in some mastodons and not in others? Uh, it doesn't seem to be completely related to biogeography. Um, some of it may be related to environment or climate uh, because it does seem like chin tusks are present in, uh, large chin tusks are present in animals that are uh, occupying warmer uh, climates. So like interglacials or deeper in time. But we also see kind of residual chin tusks or vestigial chin tusks in some of our most recent mastodons. So one of the, the, the last mastodons standing in, in Wisconsin still has tiny little chin tusks in its lower jaw. So there's some, wow. some really interesting patterns that like, uh, you know, a lot of the morphology and a lot of the extinctions uh, patterns, you know, they aren't really evident. Um, and so we're still working on those. We're still trying to, to collect the data and, and analyze it in a way that kind of teases apart some of those patterns and, and what that underlying uh, cause might be. Well, another question that always pops up these days is, can we bring the mammoth back to life using DNA and gene extraction? Chris, information gleaned from DNA research has really advanced in recent years. So has it cleared things up or just throwing a spanner in the works. So this has been really, it, DNA has been transformative in how we think about mammoths. Um, so a lot of the, 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 the genetic techniques, the genomic techniques that we've used to analyze mammoth populations, they, they were developed for mammoths. So for instance, some of the baiting techniques that we use to get uh, you know, good DNA out of bad fossils uh, were developed to really tease apart some of these mammoth population patterns um, from, from fossils that are south of the ice that are, are not as well preserved as things in the Arctic. And, and so the, the DNA story itself, and these DNA methods, uh, they've really come back. They've, they've told us a lot about the mammoth evolutionary history. A lot of times we have to kind of step back and think about, okay, how is that 
aligning with what we already knew. So for a hundred years, for 200 years, we've been measuring teeth and measuring bones and trying to understand, you know, how these different mammoth species are different, um, you know, depending on where and when you are. Uh, and that's all we had up until about 2016, 2014, when we really started getting DNA from morphologically different kinds of mammoths. Up until that point, most of the mammoth DNA was coming from Arctic specimens, which mm. we were all assumed were woolly mammoths. Um, 2016, Jacob Inc. Uh, published a paper, and, and there was a bunch of us on it that were contributing specimens and thinking about how the morphology might tie into that. And this was one of those kind of um, uh, watershed moments in thinking about North American mammoths, where we really have a, a, a mammoths from California and from uh, Tennessee, we're really not all that different. Uh, well, Illinois, we didn't have any Tennessee mammoths in the data set, but they really weren't all that different genetically, but morphologically, they were, they were you know, just worlds apart. Mm -hmm. And so this is something that we've kind of had to come to terms with is that the DNA and the morphology may not be telling us the same things. They're, they're both right, but we have to figure out a way to align them. And, and so a lot of the work on mammoths has really focused on trying to align those sorts of things. As for de-extinction and cloning mammoths, um, you know, I, my my understanding of it, and I am not a geneticist, I am a vertebrate paleontologist, so I deal with the stones and bones of the record, not necessarily mm -hmm. with, with amino acids. Uh, but uh, my understanding is that cloning a mammoth is going to be very difficult or impossible. However, uh, the, the idea of actually creating a mammoth-like Asian elephant is technically possible. And this has been the, uh, the, 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 the approach that has really seemed to be productive uh, with the, de the, the people who are really pushing for de-extinction. Um, the reasons for de-extincting uh, woolly mammoths um, have often been given as, well, this will combat climate change because what mm. we can do is reintroduce woolly mammoths to, uh, to tundra environments in Siberia, and they will um, crop the, the vegetation closer to the ground, and so therefore it will, pre it will prevent permafrost from melting and uh, it will prevent wow. more CO2 from entering the atmosphere. While this may be the case, um, the ability to scale up uh, to ecosystem scales, mm -hmm. a, a, an, a an mammoth like Asian elephant, I just don't see that happening. Um, you know, yes, someday you may be able to create a, a mammoth like Asian elephant. Uh, it's but creating hundreds is going to be much, much, much more difficult. Um, there are much more efficient ways and cost-effective ways of doing many of the same things. So bring in some horses, bring in some bison, bring in some other animals that are going to graze that 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 hmm. vegetation down and open up that permafrost to 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 keep it frozen. Um, so I think at some level, you know, this is a you know this would be really cool. Um, so we're going it, it will attract a whole lot of funding and it will attract a whole lot of attention. Uh, but from the from as an ecologist, I don't see it really changing the ball game. Um, de extinction in general is is uh, it's kind of a high cost, it's a high risk investment, and ultimately it's a very low return. Um, so the possibility of actually changing the game in terms of climate change um, probably not going to happen. Unless they employ a kind of a uh, Jurassic Park <laughs> kind, of, <laughs> kind of attitude. Toward, well, let, let's put some on display and we can charge whatever we want. Yeah, well, I mean, ultimately creating one mammoth is probably doable. Creating hundreds of new mammoths, hmm, that's going to be tough. Well, it's such a fascinating subject, and I'm sure that we could find even more to explore in these animals. But what about your current and future projects? Uh, what's new in the world of vertebrate? Paleontology. Well, I, I haven't tapped out proboscideans yet. <laughs> and even <laughs> mammoths. There's, so mammoths get a lot of attention because the record is just so spectacular. Uh, we have mammoth mummies. We have, uh, you know, great preserved fossils in, in Arctic environments. And they're, they're kind of uh, pretty dense on the landscape, even down south here. Um, but there are still questions to answer. I don't think that we've completely... Uh, 
we've completely defined the edges of their niche. So there's been some recent work on on uh, dwarf elephants in the Mediterranean and, and how they often uh, are, are evolving differently than mainland populations. And we have some, um, you know, uh, island mammoths here in North America that I would love to see more work on, on out on the California Channel Islands where we have pygmy mammoths. Um, probably it's this, this pygmy mammoth population. It's a full-size mammoth population that, that, that colonized these islands and then slowly got, or maybe not so slowly, uh, got much smaller. And then you had periodic influxes of new mammoths, new full-size mammoths out onto these islands. So teasing apart what's going on there ecologically is, would just be fascinating. Um, so there are there are some of these areas where we still haven't quite pieced together uh, the mammoth record uh, and, and really understand what they're doing and, and why they're doing it and where they're doing it. Um, you know, there's, there's a, even in places like Mexico City where they've discovered all these new mammoths associated with some of these uh, lake deposits. Um, you know, there's a lot of really great questions that can be asked uh, of these new finds of these new records. So I think mammoths are, are one, there's, there's, there's still plenty of questions to be asked. One of the things that we'll be thinking about in future uh, is, uh, you know, thinking about kind of teasing, piecing together their life histories in much more detail. So there was this great paper, I mentioned it before, about um, the Alaskan uh, mammoth and tracking an Alaskan mammoth through geochemical signatures in its tusk across the landscape, what it was eating, when it was eating it, where it was when it was eating those things. And those are things that we're working on those techniques to do with um, southern mammoths as well. So we, we've been working on them for uh, mammoths from Texas and, and Missouri and South Dakota and, and Virginia. And, uh, you know, really understanding kind of how the ecology of mammoths differs in different places in different times. So you're basically kind of creating, figuring out the process, figuring out the how mammoths interact with their environment, uh, depending on how that environment uh, changes. And, and, you know, that plays into things like extinctions, it plays into things like why do we have, um, you know, why do we have new species of mammoths coming? So, you know, the, those sorts of questions are really uh, still there for mammoths. Um, a lot of my work now is is focused on mastodons and the evolutionary history of mastodons. It's something that uh, you know we thought we had figured out uh, for about a hundred years. There just wasn't much done on the systematics of mastodons. And then in the last two or three years, we've really started uh, kind of saying, okay, it's not just one single monolithic species. There's actually a lot of morphological diversity and a lot of genetic diversity within this group of animals. And so um, I think that there's a lot of, of work to be done there. Um, and that's not even touching uh, gomphotheres, which is the other major proboscidean oh, yeah. group here in North America that would be, uh, you know, that, that thinking about the ecology and the systematics of gomphotheres is also one that is, uh, uh, will be a lot of fun. Uh, and we've kind of, you know, poked at it through the years, but uh, it's, it's something that given some of these new techniques and even a, a new paper that just came out this week on, uh, on gomphotheres, uh, gomphotheres DNA and gomphotheres evolutionary histories from Brazil, um, or actually Uruguay. Uh, you know, this, these are things that are evolving very quickly. They're, they're projects that are evolving fairly quickly. And so it's yeah. always exciting to be thinking about proboscideans. Absolutely. And I know that uh, you mentioned dwarf mammoths. There's uh, uh, a young lady that we see on television and documentaries over here in England uh, fairly often, uh, Tori Herridge. Uh, she does a lot of great work on dwarf mammoths. Isn't that right? Yes. Uh, and and Tori's work is, is fantastic. And it's her work or, or her research group uh, or a research group that she was part of anyway, uh, that was working on the Sicilian dwarf elephant uh, that just came out um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and it was looking at, you know, elephants are long lived animals. And so they provide these really neat evolutionary histories or, or really neat uh, ecological histories at an individual time scale. And what they were looking at is, uh, you know, what can growth changes in a tusk tell us about the life of that animal? And these are things are developing these techniques and they're developing techniques that can be used on, you know, almost any proboscidean. And so we can, uh, you know, use those techniques to, to tackle mastodons or tackle mammoths or tackle gomphotheres. And so this is one of the fun things that I, I really enjoy about my job. Uh, there's always a new technique or a new method that's out there um, that will tell you something new and different. 
And so I get to come to work every day. And when I go home, I may have learned something new that no one else knew before. Mm -hmm. And that is always a really, um, a really fun uh, feeling to have. I will leave links to your social media and research papers in the description below. And all that's left to say is thank you very much indeed, Chris. And hopefully we can have you back on the show one day in the very near future. Thanks, Mark. It's been my pleasure.